everybody. Welcome back to Trippin' Life Lessons from Abraham, and we are in Lesson 11. That's right, we've made it all the way to number 11. And I'm kind of mixing messages today. Uh, my hat for the lesson, I'm actually cheating a little bit. Uh, I did Quadulane a while back. Well, this is my Roy Nemer hat, and I, you've actually seen a few pictures of Roy Nemer if you saw that lesson. Because there are two little islands in a little um, chain of uh, islands and... Uh, but I really don't have that many interesting places that I've been to, like I told you, so I'm stretching a little bit. And this shirt, by the way, since the Marines, the Army actually invaded Kwajalein and liberated it, the Marine, uh, 4th Division, liberated Roy Namur. So, I'm also wearing this shirt. I don't know if you can see it, but it, this is, uh, we got this when we were in Beijing. I got to uh, go to the embassy, and this is one of the shirts that the... Uh, Marine Corps Guard Detachment at each of our embassies. They make these shirts. They sell them for um, to raise some funds. So I picked up a couple of them, and here we go. Very cool. All right, enough of that. <laughs> Let's get into the lesson today. Life Lessons with Abraham. This is Lesson 11, and this is really the end of Abraham. Uh, we have one more lesson that we're going to do next week, but that's going to be Abraham in the New Testament. Like I said last week, the story of Abraham... It peaks with Isaac, and then, boom, it ends in a big hurry. I've titled today's lesson, Keeping the Legacy Alive, and it covers Genesis 24 and 25, because at the end of Abraham's life, a lot of stuff happens. I mean a lot. But it happens very quickly in the text, and it shows that Abraham, as he approached uh, his own death, was not all focused on himself. He didn't sit back in a rocker and think about the good old days or whatever. He was thinking ahead. He was looking at what was going to happen after he was gone with Isaac and his other children. And he was very much uh, focused on keeping the legacy of God's um, covenant with him alive, not only in Isaac's life, but thereafter as well. So let's take a look. Number one on your outline. Abraham looked beyond himself. Abraham looked beyond himself. And as this lesson is videoed, I am approaching my 59th birthday. Uh, I will be 59 in um, about uh, just under, one day under two months. Okay? So I, I think I'm qualified a little bit to speak on this. I've seen a lot of what happens with people as they grow older. And unfortunately in our culture, a lot of people as they grow older get more self-centered and self-focused. And that's not good and that's not biblical. Now, I don't know how old uh, you are watching this, but no matter if you're young or if you're old, this is something you need to think about and prepare as you go through life. I want you to look at what Abraham did here. This is uh, Genesis 25, 1-6. Abraham took another wife. Yes, we're going to go through some names, folks, so prepare yourself, because I cannot guarantee I will pronounce them all correctly. <laughs> he took another wife whose name was Keturah, and she bore him Zimran, Jokshan, uh, Medan, Median, Ishbak, and Shua. Abraham gave all he had to Isaac, but to the sons of his concubines, Abraham gave gifts, and while he was still living, he sent them away from his son Isaac eastward to the east country. Hmm. Okay, so Sarah has passed away. Abraham's old, but he's uh, pretty feisty for an old guy. <laughs> You know, the old joke about uh, there may be snow on the roof, but there's fire in the oven or whatever. So uh, he remarries, and he has some kids. Oh, yeah. And what does he do with them, and what happens here? Well, the first bullet point under number one uh, says this. God calls me to be concerned about the next generation. To be concerned about the next generation. You'll notice that Abraham here, he just doesn't marry this... Uh, I'm assuming she's a younger woman, how old she was, we're not told, and crank out some babies and then say, okay, everybody, good luck, I'm checking out. No, before he died, he very carefully prepares and uh, is fair to everybody, but at the same time clearly favors Isaac because Isaac is the son of the covenant. And he makes sure that, that his other children are not, uh, are not, they're not left destitute. He gives them stuff, gives them enough, but then he sends them away. Why? Because he doesn't want any conflict or anything else happening that's going to deter what's going on with Isaac. 
Look at this uh, great passage from Psalm 71. This is what I call, this, this, this is just verses 17 and 18. A lot of people have what they call a life verse. I never even heard about that till, oh, I guess 20 years ago when I read The Purpose Driven Church by Rick Warren. And uh, he talks about his life verse in there. And then all of a sudden they had a lot of people popping up with life verses. And I was like, well, I don't have one. And then I came across this passage one day as I was reading through my Bible. And uh, this is what I call the rest of my life verses. It's not just one verse, but, you know. I mean, I, I discovered this in my 50s, so <laughs> to call it a life verse, I just call it the rest of my life. Look at this. Since my youth, O oh God, you have taught me, and to this day I declare your marvelous deeds. Even when I am old and gray, yes, yes, do not forsake me, O oh God till I declare your power to the next generation, your might to all who are to come. Hmm, see now, this is great to me. Here's a guy who's not just thinking about himself or just his generation. He's thinking about what can I do to help influence the next. Now, clearly, you know, you have your time on earth and then you die and then people do whatever they're going to do and it's not your concern because you're not there. But, if we're going to be responsible and if God blesses us and we live long enough, we can and should do what we can to influence and equip and prepare the next generation. Not only of leaders, if you're in a leadership position, but just people in general. And today we can see a lot of pastors doing that. Rick Warren I mentioned, um, a lot of guys. And look at, um, look at uh, Billy Graham, for example. Now he's retired and you don't hear or see much from him, but... In his last years, he's presenting an, just an absolute awesome role model to everyone about what it means to be Christian and how a Christian lives and faces the kind of adversity that often comes with old age. And you have Bill Hybels and a lot of other people that are doing this too that are, that are teaching and preparing the next generation, and that's exactly what should happen. As disciples of Jesus, you and I should not just be concerned with our challenges and our own stuff, but we should also be thinking down the road what do we do? How do we uh, prepare the next generation? How do we help them reach their generation? Because, of course, as you know, in this country, every generation, the younger you go, the less the impact the gospel has. And the more unchurched and the more alien Judeo-Christian morality is to these kids, much less having a Christian worldview, much less knowing Jesus. Okay, so it's a huge challenge. And, and we have to be concerned about that if we're really going to be uh, authentic followers of Jesus Christ. Now, there's another example in the Old Testament of a guy totally not like this. He was actually a pretty good guy for the most part, but boy, on this one, he really fails. It's in 2 Kings chapter 20, verses 16 through 19. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord. The time will surely come when everything in your palace and all that your fathers have stored up until this day will be carried off to Babylon. Nothing will be left, says the Lord. And some of your descendants, your own flesh and blood, that will be born to you, will be taken away, and they will have become eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Now, you would think this would be horrible news, right? I mean, imagine if, if a prophet came to you and said, uh, everything you own is going to be taken away or destroyed by an evil invading force, some of your children, grandchildren, they're going to be led away into captivity. They may die. It's going to be awful. It's going to be a horrible catastrophe. It's coming, I'm telling you now. How would you respond to that? Well, look how Hezekiah responds. The word of the Lord you have spoken is good, Hezekiah replied. For he thought, will there not be peace and security in my lifetime? Oh, talk about selfish. Wow. <laughs> I mean, the thing I love about this is it shows us that uh, we are hardly the first generation of people to deal with being selfish. There's a lot of discussion today in America, of course, about, well, you know, we're, we're, we're spending all of our children's and our grandchildren's money, and how are they going to repay this with all of this stuff and whatever, and okay, fine. Well, we're not the first people to be only concerned about ourselves. Since Adam and Eve, people have always been that way. That's the normal part of human nature. And Hezekiah here, really, uh, it's just kind of brutal the way he shows it. He's just like, well, thank God, at least, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to have it good. Sorry, kids. Sorry, grandkids. Uh, it's going to be really sucky for you, but 
It's okay for me, so we're good. Wow. That is horrible. And that is not the way a disciple should act. That's not the way a human should act, you might think. Well, maybe not. But for sure, as a disciple of Jesus, we have to be concerned about the next generation. We need to learn from Abraham as we watch him wrap up his life. Number two. Abraham stayed on mission until the very end. He stayed on mission until the very end. He never really retired or gave up. Take a look at this passage from Genesis 24, verses 3-6. through 6. It says, That I may swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell, but will go to my country and to my kindred and take a wife for my son Isaac. And the servant said to him, Perhaps the woman may not be willing to follow me to this land. Must I then take your son back to the land which you came? And Abraham said to him, See to it that you do not take my son back there. Now, he's talking to his servant. He, he is trying to set up at the right time, because he knows he's not going to live as long as a normal father would for a son, because he was pretty old when you know, Isaac was born how to get Isaac a proper wife. And he wants a wife from his own people. But he doesn't want Isaac to go back there. In fact, he says, no way is that going to happen. Why? Because he's afraid if he goes back, he stays there, and thus ends God's plan. Isaac has to stay in the promised land if what God called to happen is going to happen. So he says, you go back there, and you get somebody. The kid stays here. Okay, That's the, the picture that's going on here. The first bullet point, notice that. It says, it's not about starting well, but finishing well. It's not about starting well, it's finishing well. See, Abraham knows that if he doesn't uh, c uh, preserve this legacy and impart this vision and this passion and this legacy to Isaac, everything he's done in his life, everything he's gone through in his life, will be for nothing. He, he knows that clearly. So he's all about preparing so that he can finish well, so that when he dies, he knows he's done everything possible to make sure that the work of God goes on. This consumed him, and this was his passion, and would to God more of us were like that. This is, this is the way God wants us to be. In fact, look at number three on your outline. God is calling me to finish my mission. Now again, if, if you're really young and you're listening to this, you may think, well, <clears throat> you know, dude, I'm in my 20s. What, uh, what are you talking about? Well, yeah, you are now, but you know, it's not going to be that long. I know you think it's going to take a long time to get to be as old as me, but you're wrong. You're going to turn around and be an old guy just like me. And when you reach that point, I hope you'll remember this video. And I hope you'll think to yourself, you know, that old, because of course I'll be dead by then, but I hope you'll think to yourself, that old dead Louis was right. He was right. <laughs> Life goes fast. And i got to stay on mission, and i got to prepare to finish my mission if I'm really going to live the way God wants me to live. Uh, I want you to look at this uh, passage from Acts chapter 21. This is a great example of, of uh, preparing to uh, finish my mission. While we were staying for many days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. And coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, This is how the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver, it into the hands, uh, deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. And when we heard this, we and the people there urged him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, What are you doing, weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be in prison, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And since he would not be persuaded, we ceased and said, Let the will of the Lord be done. See, Paul is on mission. And Paul wants to finish the mission well. And, you know, we tend to think that the apostles knew everything. Well, they didn't. Paul didn't know when he was going to die. He didn't know uh, what exactly was going to happen. And he didn't really care that much. He was simply all about obeying God and following the Holy Spirit and doing what God told him to do. And if that meant he was going to die in Jerusalem, fine, bring it on, let's go. I'm going. So God sent Agabus, this prophet, to give him a, a picture of what was going to happen to him, that he was going to be imprisoned. And of course, 
And notice this is one of the we passages. So Luke is actually there when this happens. And Luke says, When we heard this, we and the people there urged him not to go. They're saying, please, don't go, Paul. We, you know, you're going to be put in jail, man. You could be killed. You could be, it, it, it's bad. Just stay here. You don't need to go back there. Stay here. Stay with us. We love you. It's got a great thing going here. Think of the people that you could impact. Think of the lives you could change. Think of how God could use you like he has been using you. But what's Paul do? Paul says, what are you doing? <laughs> I love that. What are you doing? Weeping and breaking my heart. You know, a lot of people think um, that Paul wasn't a, a very soft-hearted or kind-hearted person. He really was. We don't see a lot of that in his letters, of course, because he's dealing with issues and problems. And so he's, you know, a lot of times in that authoritative position of having to correct and discipline and, and teach. Uh, but that doesn't mean that he didn't really love and care for these people. And you see it, if you look for it, you see it. And this is one of the places where you see it. He says, what are you doing, weeping and breaking my heart? I'm ready not only to be in prison, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord. So he's ready to go. He's going to finish well. And if it costs him his life, so be it. He's going to finish well. And I love, too, the reaction of the people here, because we could learn a lot from this. A lot of times, Christians are well-meaning, but they let their emotions get ahead of them. And they actually deter people from serving God because when people want to go do something that's dangerous or risky and, you don't, and you're afraid for them, that fear just and, and you know overrides you and you go to them like Paul. But then when they say, I'm going to go serve the Lord, this is what God wants me to do, a lot of times we just keep on whining and complaining and begging and pleading and arguing. They didn't do that. Look at that. Since he would not be persuaded, we ceased and said, let the will of the Lord be done. See, these people... They were committed to the will of God, too. Now, Paul's a few steps ahead of them because he's Paul. He's an apostle. He's a leader. He'd probably won many, if not all of them, to Christ. But still, they were mature enough spiritually to realize, look, this is what he's going to do. This is what God's called him to do. So let's just turn this over to God. Let's pray. Let's bless him. Let's be supportive because this is what he's going to do. And, you know, that's a really good Christian attitude. If you want to help somebody finish their mission, help them. Don't hinder them. Say, yeah, but, but it's risky, it's dangerous. Well, so what? Getting out of bed in the morning is dangerous. Jesus told us following him was going to be dangerous. Where did we lose sight of this? Why do we American Christians so often think that I should be able to serve God with no risk and no danger? That's impossible. And we had better rediscover that because our culture is changing and hostility to the gospel is rising and many, many of you, the younger you are, the more this is true of you, are going to face that hostility and, and levels of persecution that people in my generation and certainly my parents' generation never would have even dreamed of. But it's coming. I believe it will happen. And maybe even in my lifetime. So they uh, supported him when they saw that he wasn't going to be changed. Now... I first preached this uh, series on Abraham, which when I did was a lot shorter than it is now, in Parker. It was the last series I preached there before moving uh, to another church that I served for a few years and then uh, transitioned into uh, being a traveling teacher. And this was the last message I preached. This lesson I'm teaching you was the last sermon I preached to them. And the last point of that sermon was this. The legacy of my mission is in your hands. Now I said that, obviously, because the truth of the matter is, pastors don't know how well they've done until they leave a church. When you leave a church, if it all falls apart, if the new guy comes in and he's, of course he's not going to be you, he's going to be different than you, and you know everybody leaves, and everybody whines, everybody complains, and everybody you know gossips and backstabs and everything else because they don't have you know whoever it was that was there before then that says a lot of things about your ministry and not a lot of good things. On the other hand, if the majority of the people stay, you will always lose people in transition. So that's a given. And that's fine because some people are just not... Nobody can minister to everybody, okay? So some people are just would be better off if, if I was their pastor not to be in that church, to be somewhere else because I'm just simply not the right guy for them. And that's okay. But I'm talking about in huge, large numbers. 
if the majority of the people stay and hang in there in spite of the difficulty of transition, and it's so difficult, it's like, you know, it's like pulling teeth, really. If you've been through it, you know. Then that says, yeah, you, you did a pretty good job there. And that's what I was getting at when I was uh, talking to them. In a far lesser sense, that's true of this series, too. We're going to wrap it up next week, but um, guess what? The truths that we've talked about live on, and if you take them and live them out, and if your life is transformed to be more like Christ, then my teaching ministry, that's good. That's a good part of my legacy, even though I may never know it. On the other hand, if you don't, well, then that's a, that's a minus. Again, it doesn't matter whether I know it or not. God knows it. And so the legacy of this series of lessons, of, of my ministry to you during these last few weeks, they're about to be put into your hands. Look at this. Then Abraham breathed his last and died at a good old age, an old man full of years, and he was gathered to his people. His sons Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the cave of Machpelah near Mamre in the field of Ephron, the son of Zohor the Hittite, the field Abraham had bought from the Hittites. There Abraham was buried with his wife Sarah. After Abraham's death, God blessed his son Isaac, who had lived near uh, Bir Lahi Roy. Now I love this scene for a lot of reasons. First of all, we never did get to talk about how Abraham bought this land, but he had bargained with um, the Hittites, and uh, they did this typical kind of Arab bargaining where the uh, where the guy starts says, "Oh, I'll just give it to you." And you know, see, I remember the first time I read that, I thought, "Well, take it, dude." But Abraham wouldn't take it. And part of the reason he wouldn't take it is that the guy didn't want him to take it. The guy's trying to appear generous, and then Abraham gets to appear generous, and then they go back and forth, and finally at the end of it, they have reached an agreeable price for the land, and both men appear generous. And in that culture, that's really important, and it's still true today in much of Arab culture. So I love the fact that the only piece of land he ever owned was a burial plot, and it was for first Sarah, and then later, of course, he was buried there too. And I love the fact that Isaac and Ishmael come back together. This is the only time in Scripture we see them together doing anything. Now, they coexisted for a while in Abraham's household, but in terms of, as, as actually, you know, adult men, this is it. And I love that because it shows the fact that, in spite of everything else, Abraham must have had some kind of relationship with Ishmael. And Ishmael came back to honor his father. And together... Uh, if there were differences at that time between Isaac and Ishmael, we all know about the differences between the Arabs and the Jews now, but at that time, who knows? We don't know. They set them aside to love and honor and bury their father. That is awesome. I love that. That's such a beautiful, beautiful picture. The legacy of Abraham shows right there. These two sons of his, these two sons honored and loved their father. That says a lot for the relationship and the impact he had upon them. And so he's finished, they bury him, and then they go their separate ways, and God blesses Isaac. Now, this isn't the only picture we have of a ministry and a life coming to an end. In uh, Tim, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1-5, through 5, Paul is preparing Timothy for his death. Here's what he writes. He says, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is judge, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, Repu reprove, I'm sorry, can't read today, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Do you see how Paul is thinking of this next generation? He knows that now he is about to die. And he knows that it's Timothy and young men like him who are going to carry the gospel in the church into the next generation. And without them, it's a lost cause because the church is never more than one generation away from extinction. You're not born a Christian. You become a follower of Jesus. You become a disciple when you give your life to him. It's a decision. The church carries on because people choose to love and follow and obey Jesus. And Paul knows this, and so he's saying, Timothy, 
You got to do this. You got to be ready, whether it's the right time or not for you, whether it's convenient or not, to teach, reprove, rebuke, exhort. Be patient, though. Don't blow your stack. Don't yell and scream at people. Teach them. Teach them deeply to be like Jesus. And then he ends it. I love it. He says, be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Paul ended his life not focused on himself, not thinking about himself, but helping to prepare his son, spiritual son Timothy, to carry the work forward, to preserve his legacy in his life. And today, we're exactly the same. You and I, as disciples of Jesus, are still carrying forward the legacy of Paul, which was the legacy of Jesus, and the legacy of all the people between Paul and here. Been a long road to get from Paul to me. <laughs> and to you. Who knows? I don't have any idea when you're watching this. I could be dead and you could be watching this, you know. But some of you have watched this and think I am dead. Uh, and are really bored. And I'm sorry about that. But for the rest of you, you can see that, that how that legacy carries on. Now the question is, what are you doing to help prepare the next generation? What are you doing to finish your mission well and help someone else be prepared to carry that legacy forward and finish their ministry well what are you doing? Are you sitting around feeling sorry for yourself? Are you thinking, oh, I'm old and nobody cares, nobody listens to me? Well, people, maybe they will if you'll love them and care for them and minister to them. Are you pouring your life into the lives of others? Especially those of younger generation that you can carry it forward? Are you committed to fulfilling your ministry and doing it as long as you can? Now, I realize things happen and you can't always can't teach right up to the moment you die. People have asked me about that. You know, I would love to finish preaching a sermon or teaching a lesson and then just drop dead. I mean, that would be ideal for me. Finish my work, boom, I'm gone. But that doesn't always happen. So if it doesn't, it doesn't. But finishing my ministry doesn't mean I work up to the moment I die. It means I work up to the moment where I simply can't do it anymore. And that I'm focused on that next generation to keep the legacy alive. You're going to be discussing this in just a moment in your lesson and in your group, and uh, I hope that as you do, you'll think about it, pray about it. Don't just let it go at the end of tonight's meeting, or today's meeting, or whatever you're meeting, but pray and think about it all this next week, and say, God, what can I do to help prepare and carry forward the gospel into the next generation? What do you want me to do, Lord, to make that happen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, it's so easy to get self-centered and self-involved, and as we get older, Lord, we're supposed to get wiser, but it gets harder, Lord. It physically, it gets harder. Mentally, it gets harder. And the culture, again, pushes us. And a lot of times we end up forgetting about our mission from you and our ministry and simply focusing on ourselves. And I pray you won't let that happen. I pray that from a young age, Lord, you will burn it into our hearts. Or if we're old and listening to this right now, you'll burn it into our hearts right now, whatever age we are to finish our mission, to finish well. And as part of finishing well, help us, Lord, to do what we can to prepare the next generation so that they can finish well. May your gospel go forward in power, Lord Jesus, we pray in your name. Amen. All right, that's it. Go have a great time and a great discussion. Uh, and again, as we always say, just be honest and open up now. Next week's the final lesson. Real quickly, I want to make a suggestion to you. I want to suggest that the following week, week 13, because there will be 12 lessons in this series, that you get together and just have a party. Now, I'm going to try to include a little something special on the disc for that 13th meeting. So if you're not going to meet on the 13th meeting, then there should be something else on the menu you can play. A little behind-the-scenes stuff, just a little few things I want to share. Uh, but uh, I hope you'll do that. And it's part of the meeting. Just talk about what are you taking away from this series. If you could pick one or two or three things as takeaways from the from the from the uh, series of lessons, what would it be? Start thinking now. Look back through your lesson plan and pull a few things out and be prepared to share that uh, on on, on week thirteen. All right, I'm done. I'm out of here. God bless you. Take care. Have a great discussion. I'll see you later. Oh, totally missed. <laughs>